Yeah, we seek you here, we seek you there. Well, that was the original title, but that's what really I meant. And we do, don't we? And you have to sort of look at some of those photographs and think, they're really intrepid people. You know, this guy's stuck up on a mountain here somewhere. Him's got the tent, but notice he's on his own. I take my hat off to her, fair dudes, you know, standing there, doesn't know what's going on, except that she's just holding the aerial. And then there's the guy with the bike. We all like to be there, wouldn't we? No, 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 not really. And the question that came to my mind, well, well, you know, why do we do it? And we think of good old macaroni there who started it all going, but it all goes from, from, from him through to this and all stations in between. And it's a hobby where no matter what your age, no matter what your inclinations and, and, and interests within the hobby, there's something there for you. So if all you are doing is, all you are doing in inverted commas, if that's your interest in constructing, they'll keep you going forever. Uh, if you're into getting outside and getting a bit of exercise, or whether you're working from inside the shack, certificate collecting, working with young kids, and young kids themselves getting involved in amateur radio, there's so many different um, facets to it. And it seems to be one of those hobbies that I think has got something different for everybody. And we sometimes think, I wonder why we don't see so-and-so doing such and such. Well, because so-and-so is actually doing something that I'm not particularly interested in within radio. But it keeps him happy or her happy. And that seems to be, from my point of view, the big appeal. But when it comes down to it, whether it's the fun, the learning, the friendship, the challenge of doing something new, there's also what I would call the community aspect in it. And thank goodness we don't have the sort of things that are on some of those pictures. In this country, we seem to not have the, the excesses of nature that they get and they have to suffer and put up with in other parts of the world. But the astute among you will be able to tell me something about that. Pardon? Top right is England. Top right is England. So, yes, we do get some extremes, and they're sudden and they're fierce. And I think that one was done in Devon just a couple of years ago. What we tend to get when we get involved with the non-amateur community around us is this sort of stuff, whether it be firework displays or fates or carnivals or things of that sort, or yes, another flood. And sometimes even the blue light services want our help because their systems sort of fall over. Now, no, this isn't an advert for Rainet. What I'm saying here is that you've got an, a, a hobby where you've got an opportunity to push out little fingers into the local community and get them involved in what we're doing and, of course, at the same time, sell uh, what we do and get them on site. So when they see this dirty, great big aerial on a blue tower stuck outside dove trees in <laughs> Covington for a week, they, <laughs> they say, oh yeah, it's that loony again, but he's not right yet. Yeah. Well, what about Swindon Radio Club and getting out there and involved with the community? Well, once upon a time, for those old enough to remember, <coughs> we had Bertha. Bertha, as you can see from the insignia, once belonged to the Royal Mail. And basically, it was intended originally as a radio detector van, or words to that effect. Then it became a, a, ve a vehicle for experimenting with um, coverage mapping and things of this sort, and if you were very careful, and not very clever, not very easy to see, but just up there you can see a 20-foot pump-up Clark mass that comes out the top of the roof, which was quite a useful little beastie. So we just drive up with Bertha, get in the back or the door on the other side, <coughs> you'd sit down at a nice swiveling seat, and you've got yourself a desk there, and you can get on the radio and away to go for a contest. We sort of exceeded our expectations on that and didn't think 24 was enough. So we wanted something bigger, hence the tower. But that basically where contesting for us began. Later on, we decided we needed a bit more space. And yes, we managed to get hold of, um, I can't remember the figure now, but it comes to mind, about 600 quid. We bought this 18 by 12 hospital tent ex-army hospital tent. It came actually with some extra bits of canvas that we could add on if we wanted it to make it even bigger. Uh, which actually we never used. Ever. 
But it was a very useful, uh, very useful beastie and allowed us to get out there and do some contesting. <laughs> Mind you, it was a bit of a jigsaw <laughs> puzzle. Which bit goes with what bit there? And you've, you know, you've, you've seen those Beetle Drive games where you sort of try and stick a, a, a foot on the end of an arm and you think, mm, no, I don't think so. Well, this was a bit like it because of the number of different poles, different sizes, and these um, uh, the plates here, which link them all together, are not all the same shape. So you get the spider in the right place to link those poles together, and you suddenly realize, no, I don't think the roof goes up at that angle, or out at that angle. So it was a bit of a, a jigsaw puzzle. It needed a team. And actually, yeah, it needed a team to put it up as well. Uh, in that particular case, these intrepid boys are actually putting the tent up um, at the moment, but there were only, uh, what, five of them there? Um, you have to be a bit careful, as Tony and uh, where's Chris? Well, Chris isn't here, no, but Mike will know as well that if you get it to that stage and the wind gets in underneath there, you've now got yourself a homemade flying machine. And it did on one occasion, I can remember, tucked underneath the hedge down at uh, Earl's Court Farm. Lovely sunny day, suddenly a breeze came up, whee, up it went, and the whole thing went over on its, well, near enough, went over on its roof. I have this vision of Chris hanging onto the poles at the top, trying to hold it down. Not big enough. So it's, it's a team job. It really, really is a team job. And sometimes the team is even bigger. That's where some of the problems start to come in, because if you've got to put this tent up, you can't really put it up single-handed. There is a, a rumour around some time that once upon a time there was a guy who was here called Hugh, who one morning we went up to Barbary Castle and he had to take his wife into Swindon Station. He lived out to Kemble Way. He had to take his wife into Swindon Station for her to go off to London on a course. So it's Saturday morning, it's about a past six. We're going to meet up at Barbary about 9, 9.15, 10 o'clock in my case, um, as we normally do. We got up there at whatever it was past nine. Ten was up. We'll put that up. He did. One yeah. man. Now, how he did that, I will never know. But personally, I think he had a few of the little people around at the time, and they helped him. But, you know, it was up. But normally, it's a big, multi-man team job. But once you've got it up, it provided us with quite decent facilities. I mean, Derek will probably argue about decent facilities because one of the nasty bits about it was that there was this dirty great big window which is producing this, isn't that beautifully posed? A <laughs> uh, beautiful amount of light coming in through the window there, which is fantastic until you're engaged in the contest and it starts raining. Because what happens is that the water comes down the canvas, drops down to the ground, but the window is bowed out slightly. So the rain now comes on the inside of the window, and what have we got just sitting underneath it? All the electronics, like power supplies, batteries, and <coughs> Derek's power supplies died the death on that occasion because we decided that we didn't done a water test on it, and it failed. So it did have its problems. But it did provide us an amount of space. In a way, it also provided us with a bit of an opportunity for some socialization. It allowed us to store a lot of junk around the place as well. But in a way, the, the number of people that you could actually get into the tent was sometimes a little bit of a double-edged sword. Because if you're straining your ears to hear some fairly weak station, and somebody suddenly bursts out laughing at a joke that was absolutely too clever to resist, you lose that remote, very weak station. So sometimes you shh, you know, and it's a bit antisocial in a way, telling everybody to shush when they're enjoying themselves. But it did have an opportunity that we could run multiple stations inside of one area. But <coughs> the, the team business, having enough people to get it up, get the tent in, assembled and put together, the business of the social aspect of it, the possibility of it gushing water, and for those people who've been in it recently, the number of holes in the... I mean, I sat in it one day and I thought I was in um, the um, 
uh, planetarium because they were they were little bits. I thought, oh, that's Venus and that's Mars <laughs> and there's the pole star. The, the, the holes were beginning to appear. And yes, you could patch them with gaffer tape for a bit, but when the gaffer tape, as it will do, becomes more than the canvas, you start to have a little bit of a problem. So we had this lucky, lucky, very lucky move. Ian's dad stopped caravan. Granted. Um, Ian was basically stuck with the caravan. What's he going to do with it? He's going to sell it. And he decided in the end that he wasn't going to sell it, he was going to give it to us. So Ian donated that caravan, 14 foot Elvis, to Swindon Radio Club. And as I say, twas, whoops, missed that one. Twas four, uh, 12 feet, well, it's more like 13 feet actually, depending on where you measure from, uh, inside. Um, and it's got enough width in there to give you space. We sat down and thought about it. Could we actually turn it into something useful <coughs> from a radio point of view? Because the one great advantage, as you can see, is all you need is one foreman, <laughs> one operative, driver, wind down the hitch, the, sorry, the jockey wheel, uncouple the car, wind the four legs down, job's done. And you're up and you're, you're out ready to roll. And thought, we well, actually had kit inside there where we could just plug in the stuff and go, it would cut probably about three hours worth of messing about in the tent to set everything up. So what would we have inside this caravan that could be useful? Well, that's it in its original guise with two bench settees down the side there, which actually turned into beds at night, uh, a cupboard in the front there to hold all your various bits and pieces, magazines and stuff, and a plethora of shelves and lockers at a head height so that you could actually store more stuff. Looking at it from the other side, these, are, these two are the ends of the benches that I was just looking at. It had a heater in there, which was a room-sealed catalytic heater, so you didn't have any problems of fumes. You had a wardrobe, even a magazine rack to put your red cones in, um, and a toilet at the back, and a sink, etc., etc. Very nice, yeah, we can do something with that, surely. So, two years ago now, we decided that we would try it out one winter, one autumn. And we worked, um, I think it was the September contest, uh, from the van, and all we've done is we've put a table up the middle of those bench seats. And then we've got people sitting in there. Now, I remember going in to do a night shift at around about one o'clock in the morning. And I went in like I normally would for the tent. Benny hat, half a dozen layers, gloves, thick socks, shoes, <laughs> got in. I thought, oh. <laughs> and within about 10 minutes, <coughs> the shoes had gone, half the layers had gone. I was sitting there in a t-shirt. And I think it was Andy came in with a t-shirt and shorts on. <coughs> Excuse me. It was that warm in there because of course we were generating heat from the rigs. We were generating hot air like we always do. And the basic point was it was all staying inside the van. If you look at that picture very, very carefully, you would see a couple of little grey blips there. That's the window wide open. It was that warm. And thought, oh, this has got a lot going for it. But it was a little difficult. We could only get two people sitting down there, really, maybe three. Well, do you want three people sitting in front of one drink? It's probably like four people playing the piano, isn't it? <coughs> so we thought, we've got some ideas. We know what we're going to do. All we really need now are a couple of mugs. <laughs> <laughs> so the couple of mugs were contracted at great expense not, um, to <coughs> basically put something together that would be workable um, as a contest station, as a, as a demo station, as a, a face for Swindon Radio Club. Now, those people who like the top-down approach, here it is. Basically, the plan was to put benching in there so you can have two operators, one operating into that, one operating into that. <coughs> then we thought, well, can we get the services in, right? Well, we'll have some mains coming in there, 
Uh, we eventually ended up with some services going through there. We decided that nobody, we tried volunteers. Who would like to empty the loo at the end of the weekend contest? And we didn't get any results. So we thought we'd turn that into a store and save the problem. The kitchen and sink, we thought we'll keep that. And somewhere to put the beer, we'll keep the fridge as well. So that was the general, general idea. So let's see how we can get together and put that through. <coughs> Actually, the sink at the back end there is, in fact, a two-burner cooker, grill underneath, and even an oven to warm up the steak and kidney pies. And you've got a stainless steel uh, sink there with a tap which actually has an electric pump to pump the water out so you don't have to go trudging down trying to pour this dirty great big container uh, into a very small bowl. So that was, uh, was going to be kept, no problem with that. But <coughs> as I say, there's the fridge. Great thing about these caravan fridges is that they're three-way. They all work off mains, they'll work off 12 volts, or they'll work off gas. What else do we want? They'll work at any time. <coughs> <coughs> then we've got this wardrobe and heater. Well, no way we were going to lose the heater, though I must admit I'll be interested to see the first time we used it. But nevertheless, we, we kept the wardrobe as well because we thought, you know, there's opportunities to store things inside there. What else we kept? Ah, well, this was a caravan of a certain age. And a certain age ago, they didn't have noisy fluorescent lights in them. They actually used standard filament bulbs. So we had the idea we would keep the filament bulbs. These over the locker areas, uh, under locker areas, I should say, at the front of the van, these were also little 12 volt lights. So yeah, we'll keep those as well. We did replace the clock. Uh, the clock we've got in there now is a radio clock, so you guarantee that it's bang on time, or an hour late, when basically speaking, it's bang on to the second, and it gives you the date and time as well. Uh, sorry, the day and date as well. So that was that was a quick, uh, quick and easy. <coughs> we thought, right, what about what about the people who are not operating? You've got two operators, say, inside the van. What do we do? We went out and we thought we'll buy ourselves an awning. And the spec of the awning, as you can see, the actual price we paid for it, you can also see. It just happened to be at the right place at the right time where this uh, Apache Torino was going as an ex-demo from a caravan uh, uh, sales outlet. It was exactly the right one for our uh, caravan. It's 8 foot wide, so we've now got 13 foot long by 8 foot wide. If you think about the old tent, it's not that far away. And we've still got the inside of the caravan. So we thought, yeah, we'll go for that. So we've now got a caravan and an awning doubling up the width. Uh, I had to pay a lot of money for this model. Um, not as good as some of the other pictures I had. <laughs> this was, what, January, February sometime? Stupid in the year where another pair of mugs, and he's one of them, went down to the farm to see whether this um, awning would actually fit. <coughs> we were up to our ankles in mud, liquid mud. Uh, it, was, it was absolutely horrendous down there. However, we managed to get it up, we managed to check that it would work, that it was the right sort of sizes, picked up a number of photographs, ah, we have a slurp, uh, a number of photographs, <coughs> One of the key things with this awning is that you've got a, a detachable chunk here, at this end, but a similarly detachable chunk at that end, and you've got two detachable chunks at the front. So you've got total flexibility in about what you have open and what you have closed. If it's blasting summer weather, you have the lot out. If it's a bit wintry and windy and rainy, you have the lot in and anywhere in between. Even, even has a fly screen on one end, uh, this end, the one we've got out actually. So you can open up the, uh, the, the, the plastic of the window and you've still got a fly screen there to keep the, the midges away. So okay, Dennis and I, <coughs> the two mugs, into the van we go. First thing we do is to shift that lovely cupboard that was in the middle over to the far end. No, it wasn't the first thing. We stripped out all the benching first, got rid of the cushions, got rid of the timbers, and basically moved that cupboard across to the left-hand side. The idea was that this cupboard you can just see coming into the side of that shot, plus that one there, both at the same height, oh, Paddy got it right, were going to become the supports 
for the bench unit that comes down here and the bench unit that was going to go across there. So up comes all that stuff. We have some tidying up with some lighting electrics to do. We've managed to do that quite easily. And so we moved on. In went the benching. <coughs> Kitchen bench all slotted together nicely. Trunking that went round, three inch trunking that went round the outside to provide all the services but without them being too visible. The idea was, let's try and start with it neat, and then whatever we take in for a contest or for a, a, an event uh, would be added to it, sure, but it wouldn't be entangled with all the other services that were there. So we tried to make it, if you like, as plug and play, or plug and pray, as we possibly could. <coughs> that was the arrangement we were looking for. Operator 1, we'll call him, with a rig on his left, Operator 2 with a rig on his right. So we're actually looking at the people who are left-handed or right-handed. Nothing stopping these from being moved around the other way, but that would be a basic concept. PC for logging in the middle. Linear if you want them. Remember, there's a dirt great big cupboard under here, so you can put as much weight on there as you like. It ain't going anywhere. So two linears sitting in that corner as well. Here's the wardrobe. Here's the fridge. There's the door. So you walk straight in and you're into your seat. And it worked out quite nicely. <coughs> <coughs> well, try again. Yeah, I got the sequencing wrong on this one, but never mind, don't worry about it. We put in mains. Of course, we had to invert the mains plugs so that um, you can get the wires out of them and things. And um, the idea, let me get the other one up and then we can see why all the funny circles are around the place. If you imagine that this is at one end of the system, we decided that we wanted to be able to put the RF into, or from the, rig, from the rig, into this trunking, and then pick it up at the other end. So this one, let me get the orientation right, this one is for operator one. His rig goes into the RF, for his rig goes into there. His 12 volt supply goes into there. And if he's got other things like um, SWR bridges with lights on it, things of this sort, then they go into the slightly lower uh, current ones. Uh, notice the five dim there. This was to allow us to have a sequencer for pre-amplifiers and so forth inside the van, plug the, uh, the connector for the sequencer into there, and pick it up outside. And this is the mirror, if you like, of the other guy. Same sort of arrangement. And the one thing you didn't see in the top shot that is also in this one are these two phonos that allow you to pick up the PTT connection from the back of the rig and the ALC connection from the back of the rig if you want those. Rotators, <coughs> we've always had a problem with. We don't own a rotator. We always beg and borrow rotators. And of course, rotator manufacturers tend to be a bit different. So you're never really sure what kind of connection system you've got. So in the end, we thought, well, let's go flexible, quite literally. And we've got a tail coming out. We've got spades, uh, uh, crimped, um, 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 yeah, you know what I mean, forks, uh, on the end of those, so you can wire them into the back of your rotator controller according to what rotator you've got. You will also, if you are astute, notice we've got an extra socket, which isn't the main socket down there, and that's a, a, a networking socket. So yes, we've got our own network. Well, not quite. However, there we go. So imagine. Look at the bottom before you look at the photograph. Imagine that I've got my rig, I've got my PTT and ALC going in there, and I've got my uh, in my connection with my coax in there. It goes into the trunking, down the length of the trunking, and can then re-emerge on a short bit of wire to go straight into the linear, short patch lead, straight into the linear, sort of uh, RG5080 type stuff. Though, to make sure that we didn't have any more losses than we needed, we've made this line inside there out of RG213. So it's as low loss as we can reasonably manage. And then you've got this slightly larger cable here, which is the output from the linear going outside. And this is where your outside is. You've got a choice of one, two, three, four different antennas to go out into. Switches on them, do whatever you want to, but you've got four antennas going to the outside world. Not a single cable needs to run down the length of the operator's area. So, 
where are we going to get these aerials from? How are we going to get them out there and get them back in? Well, we chose a location and got Scotty to beam down a box, IP56 type box. And on this box, we've got two standard sort of caravan sockets. Those are to plug the rotator controllers into. So the rotator controller, that yellow lead that I showed you on the previous one, basically comes down to here and here for the two operators. You just plug your unit into there, and away up the mast you go. Similarly here, you've got 16 amp mains sockets. One mains coming in from whether it be generator or main supply, if we were lucky enough. And here, remembering that on some of our contests, it's nice to be able to work outside in the awning. In something like we did in uh, September, it's nice to have facilities outside in the awning as well. So we have a mains out here that goes around the corner and into the, uh, into the awning. Take the lid off the box, <coughs> basically what you see inside is all the stuff that could get very dirty, very messy and basically nanged up. So those four aerial sockets that I was just pointing to come out of there. Everything's in N. The two leads to the preamplifiers, as they now are, are coming out through there. So you've got all that stuff ready to go, and all you do is whip the lid off, plug them in, and disappear, and you're on the air. That's what, <coughs> that's what the box looks like um, in, in diagrammatic form. So, okay, we've got the mains coming in. Where's it going now? So we took one of those cupboards, remember the cupboards that we're putting the linear on? Uh, one top part basically is being kept for junk, but the bottom bit we decided we would put in the, the mains controls. So we've got in there <coughs> an RCD, which is the first thing it sees, and then some MCVs that feed the various bits. So we've got internal um, sockets that go off to the, to the sockets on the benches. We've got this one which feeds that blue that goes outside. And then we've got one for the fridge on its own so it can trip off and not keep the rest of us worried. We've got some areas called PSUs, which I'll come to in a second. And we've got a bench called repairs, which is also a second, uh, another separate too. And uh, there's expansion place for, I think, one more in that box, if I remember rightly. However, RF and RCDs, I don't know about you, but I've got a beaut of an RCD at home. It's one of these plug-in lawnmower type ones. You plug it in, you plug your lawnmower or whatever into it, you wait until someone's doing the job, and you just squeeze the PTT on your 77 mobile, and it's off. <laughs> Guarantee it every time. So we thought, this is going to be fun, because we, there we are, working North Korea, and bing, yeah, I said the and bing, this thing goes off. So we thought, how can we do that? Well, we thought if it happens, we will take that as an issue. We could spend the next 10 minutes, half an hour, whatever, plugging and playing with wires. So we thought, well, we'll preempt that. We put a bypass box in there with a switch that basically <coughs> bypasses the RCD. But so that we can't accidentally do that, because it isn't quite safe without it, is it? It's a very good question. Um, then we put a lock on it so that we know that we've deliberately taken it out. And at the moment, there is a light actually inside the cupboard, but the intention is to put a bigger light when we can find something uh, outside the cupboard over the operator's area so that if that is bypassed, then this light is on to warn us that it's, that it's actually off. But the only thing I could find was sort of burglar alarm type xenon flashers. And the worst thing you want to do when you've got your head down at 2 o'clock in the morning is see this bloody thing flashing in the corner. So we decided not to go down that yet, uh, direction yet. For those people who like diagrams, that's basically it. Mains incomer, RCD. From the RCD, feeds to those MCBs, and then each of the MCBs feeds out. Operator bench number one, operator bench number two, um, that one to the external, that one through to the repairs area, that one through to the power supplies, which I'll come to in a minute, and that one through to the fridge. So basically speaking, it's all the separate circuits as we could possibly manage in the circumstances. And of course, being professional amateurs, we tested the whole bloody lot with the appropriate equipment to make sure that it passes the latest wiring rates. Okay, so we get into the bottom end of the van. 
Was that my cursor I just saw? Yeah, I thought it was. Cursor's gone on autopilot, so anything could happen in a minute. Anyway, there's the wardrobe at the moment. And if you open up that wardrobe, we thought there's an opportunity in here for us. Because there are, as you can see, two shelves in there, plus that. This is the base of the wardrobe. But that's, when I say the base, it's about yeah, you're high off the ground. So there's a great big void underneath it. Well, we all like voids, don't we? Yeah, there's a wheel arch in that void, but it only takes up a, a proportion of it. Because if you can imagine that the centre of the wheel is there, one side of that wheel, therefore, one quadrant comes down the inside, and the rest of it is fairly spare. So we thought, right, we can play with that. So what did we do? First thing is, we got that one that got wet from Derek. Thank you very much, Derek, for the donation. That is Derek's power cube. It's capable of 16 amps. Um, and basically, what Derek also did was built us up one of his crowbar units, which he will sell to you if no, no, sorry, he's not alone. Um, basically, this crowbar will, it takes in the output from that, uh, that power supply. Uh, you will notice this little umbilical here, which is sitting there because normally we borrow a bo battery, a big one, from Bob VTA, and we stick that down there on the floor. So we've actually got battery and the power supply going to this crowbar. If anything gets reverse polarized, that box switches it off. If the voltage gets too high, that box switches it off. If the voltage drops too low, that box switches it off. So the kit that you take, we don't have kit of our own, we always depend upon the generosity of members to bring them along. That kit is pretty well protected thanks to Derek's box. <coughs> the caravan came with a unit called the Zig, which was basically a control uh, so it's a fairly young, fairly old version. It doesn't have any mains facilities. All it really does is control the caravan battery. And the caravan battery basically then has three circuits. So one for this uh, pump for the water in the sink, one for the overhead lights, and one for what they call the auxiliaries, which are those two spotlights that we were looking at earlier on, which come down at the front. So we thought, yeah, we'll use that. And we've got a battery in there, thanks to Chris, AJA. Um, and in the bottom of here, although it's not shown on this photograph, is a power supply that keeps that one topped up. So you've got separate power supplies and separate batteries for the services in the rig. That's the system that we've got for the uh, power, sorry, for the rigs. Okay, at the moment, I'll come back to that on the very last uh, slide. And for the services, that's the lights, the uh, water pump, etc. That's the system that we've got running there. Sorry? Fridges run from mains. Yeah, we're not running that off 12 volts because it does guzzle the volts. Yeah, it guzzles down the amps, that one. Okay, so we also put in a couple of holes so that you could drop your foot switch down so you could have PTT on the foot without having to have um, cables dangled over the front. And as I said earlier, we've actually got some network sockets in there, uh, courtesy of uh, um, Mark, NEA, um, and some cable that runs around the caravan. And where does it run to? It runs into the Johnny Old Wardrobe again, the centre of all systems. So we've got ourselves a, a network switch in there, and we've even got a Wi-Fi access point in there as well, so that you can be operating Wi-Fi from inside the awning, or you can travel a cable out from the inside of the van because each operator has got two network sockets. Of course, the computer he's using or she's using will only need one of them, so there's going to be spares there uh, for us to use. Now, things what are made by man or woman eventually go fut. So we thought, middle of a contest, the worst thing we can have is somebody reaching over the top of you with a soldering iron in one hand, a screwdriver in another, and a pair of cutters in their mouth. If we have a problem, we need somewhere else. So here's the fridge. Oh, look, horizontal surface just above it. That'll do. That's the repairs bench. Put in a separate set of mains for that, so if we pop anything, we only pop that circuit, not anything else. And therefore, it gives us an opportunity to do running repairs. We're also being close to the Guinness while we're at it, you see, it's always important. 
Back end of the caravan, we've got that toilet area. None of you volunteered that you wanted to. No, absolutely no me. So we thought, right, what can we do with it? We're going to turn it into our storeroom. So made up these uh, little cradles here that will keep all the ropes that we use, the cables that we use, the ropes, um, you know, the odds and sods uh, ropes, the guy stakes, uh, mains cables, and of course anyone who was up at the uh, GB2SM, the Science Museum, we've now got our own banner which lives in that cardboard tube and that's sitting in there. Water bottle, <coughs> excuse me, water bottle input, water bottle waste. <coughs> And a couple, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I said I punctuated eventually, didn't I? Uh, a couple of um, Black & Decker trestles, so that if you really want to, you can spread those out and put something on top of those as well. So you've got a reasonable number of facilities sitting in there, and it does sort of prevent people from going to the loo in there. That one, well, that's got a rotator and a few bits and pieces in it. Not much to write home about. Uh, over the top of the control circuits for the, for the mains, we've got uh, cables basically for mains, so we keep the two together so we know where to find them. And then over in the overhead lockers at the front of the van, we've got the rotator um, controller patch leads. And I made up a little gubbins that allows us to test that there's no problems with the cabling, uh, which would make you know, save saves ourselves a bit of time. And on the other one, we've got a variety of patch leads that will be both RG58, 213s, mainly ends, but some BN, uh, sorry, some 239s there, so that we can plug into things like um, conventional um, SWR meters that are using 239s. We've even got one, as you can just see just on the edge there, uh, a Heliax, an Andrews Heliax um, uh, connector as well, so that we can get that down to M type. Mentioned that already. Yeah, okay. <coughs> mentioned that one already. Uh, this is the sort of thing we have problems with. So you've got Yesu and Kenpro doing one coding system. What we've done is we've got this system which uses the standard UK trailer system. So if you're building your rotator that you're going to set up at home and you're going to give it to us, you know, loan it to us for the weekend, you can see exactly what the numbering uh, of the various cables are. But because we've gone for this flexible tails business, you can wire it any way you like as long as it works. By the way, you don't make the mistake that Den made on NFD. Two stations running. <laughs> Those, that box has got operator 1's rotator, operator 2's rotator. It is fine, providing you don't accidentally cross them over. So there was James, I think he was listening to this weakish station when he was just about getting it, and suddenly, QSB, it just disappeared. Could have something to do with the fact that whoever was in the other seat was rotating the rotator around trying to find a signal, but it wasn't his rotator, he was rotating. It was James's, because I put the plugs in the wrong way, so easy mistakes to make. <coughs> As we've gone through, we've tried to keep a note of what we've been up to, so that test report that I'm talking about, the colour coding, uh, this is the wiring arrangements for those uh, five pin DIN sockets. They're all sitting in a, a file in a folder which is sitting in a cupboard near the wardrobe. So if you have a problem, you can just flick through and find it. It doesn't need individual people. Okay, getting towards the end. Does it work? That's the acid test. Well, at the moment, here we are. Uh, NFD, at the Barbary, <coughs> pre the fire. Um, and we've got the caravan with the awning by the side of it and you can just about see some of the connections that have been set up towards it. It was a pretty fair, fair day, everything went together reasonably well. There's a couple of guys working from inside. Remember what I said about trying to keep the number of cables down? As soon as you start putting rigs in there, especially if you're putting in things like transverters and so forth, you start to increase the number of cables. But the fact that we don't have to worry about this extension cable having to go three times around the house is you just plug it straight into there. This rig, well, you know what it's like when you buy a rig. You get about two meters of cable. For in this particular case, what you need is about mm, a foot, if you like. Um, so it looks a bit messy simply because there's a lot of debris, a lot of unnecessary <coughs> cable floating around. <coughs> we were aware, and it's part of phase three, as I will call it. We were aware 
that certain things, maybe the transverter in this case, probably that rotator, and a few other bits and pieces, would be nice to have up on a shelf just above the level of the laptop lid, so that the things that you don't want very often are there, handy, but not necessarily stuck in front of you, which would give a little bit more room, for example, for the keyboard for the computer. But that, that's part of phase three. Some serious people did some serious operating. But this photograph is a very, very, very rare photograph. You're seeing that particular person pressing the button. <coughs> I will sell it to those bidding the most. Here we've had a nice bit of product placement. Um, that's YBY advertising for Martin Lynch. But he's stuck over, and he's now as operator too. And you can see that the cabling behind him is particularly bad, sort of tucked away, out of the way. And he's nicely near a bit of ventilation as well. The one I didn't mention was thanks to Frank, um, or Frank's neighbour put in Frank's direction, and Frank put it in our direction. A nice little pedestal fan stands yay high with an oscillating facility. And we've got that stuck right by the side of the wardrobe, and it spins the, the air across the caravan like there's no tomorrow. It's really great. Oh yes, there's another serious operator. I'm quite sure about his hand back when he started. Um, <laughs> but you can see that it did get some use. And we mentioned the awning, not just from a point of view of being a social area. Here we see the 77 station at field day being used in the awning, and what a pleasant place it was to work in. Yeah? Cool, bright, just the place. And as I said before, to bring the mains out of the blue socket at the front of the van, just underneath the awning. Power supply system then comes to here. You plug it in at the back, battery for the <coughs> rig in there. Absolutely lovely. The only modification we'd make is that those tables, if uh, you've seen them before, are the uh, black, no, B and Q, aren't they? Are the B and Q uh, tables. They're a bit long, and that's the only place they will fit. What we think would probably be better is a shorter set of tables running across the back of the van. Uh, sorry, yeah, across the front of the van as it is. Uh, and then that would give the whole of this back end for extra seats. The whole <coughs> operator's operate as well. But the idea worked. <coughs> Very close to finish. We took it up, took the caravan and the awning, etc. up to um, uh, Science Museum in September. Uh, GB2SN got uh, aired while we were up there. We took the tower, as you can see, and we had some interest from some people, though our position wasn't particularly clever. But people did come and visit us. And you can see the awning, see the power cables, etc., in use. And you can just see over there our brand new banner, which I think was one of the saving graces for us because it did let people know we were there. They all was SDARC. And when they got a bit closer, they found out where well, what we were. There inside the van, on the same occasion, uh, Tony in one case and Dave in the other, working GB2SM, so people outside Swindon were also getting the information that we were on the air. And there we've got uh, a field, is it? A uh, computer in the middle and a linear there uh, with an ATU at the far end. So you've got a nice big spread of kit that didn't take ages to set up and was weatherproofed, etc., etc. Right, <clears throat> this is now into the realms of imagination. Where are we going next? Well, it's part of the sort of background to my mind. It would be nice to have some signage on the van. I've just nicked that straight off the website, uh, so it doesn't look very pretty. But the idea being to identify it as being a mobile operating area rather than a holiday caravan. That's just up for, for thinking about. There are, there's a double-edged sword in a way, if you label it up, this is a radio room, someone said, oh, it must be some nickable stuff in here, let's break into it. So, it, it could be that we won't go in that direction, but maybe some kind of signage to make it look a bit prettier. The other thing is that when we were running NFD, we were running two separate rigs. We did not expect, crystal ball was a bit fuzzy that day, we did not expect to be running two rigs off 12 volts, um, and I think it was one of them as linear, with a linear running, and I don't think it were two linears running off 12, were there? No, no. No, one, one linear running off 12, and two rigs and a transverter, and a few odds and ends as well. And basically what we found 
was that the supply of volts out of here, it actually comes out 14.6. Goes through that diode, which of course loses it 0.6. The battery then comes, gets topped up, but at the same time then you've got your output going through uh, Derek's um, um, crowbar unit, and then you've got lines coming off here for the low current bits and pieces, the, the little lamps and SWR bridges and things of a sequencer, etc. And then we had one line which went to the two sockets for the one operator, and another one line went, which went for the two sockets for the other operator. And we found that we had a voltage drop on the line when all of them were keying at the same time. We could watch the voltage going and switch. Reset one of the EMPs. <coughs> yeah, reset. Yeah, one of one of the one of the yes, uh, FTMPs. You know what cheap bits of kit they are, really. Uh, they they, 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 they tin now. Now, 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 they give it away. Um, but basically, the voltage dropped sufficiently that it just said, "Nope, not playing this." So that wasn't good fun. So what we're into at the moment is that uh, we're going to set up a ring, basically speaking, probably two rings that will give us a little bit more control over the voltages that we can actually be supplying from both ends. And also, with a bit of belt and braces, if we should still find we've got a problem, we can take another switch mode PSU and feed the input from that, or the output from that, into that ring as well to give it a bit more better when we... So that was that was temporarily, wasn't it? Temporarily. Yeah, temporarily, that's exactly what we did. We, we took one of the um, SEC1223 little power supplies, which will give 25 amps, uh, stuck that on the end of it, uh, on the end of one of the lines that we've got, cured the problem. So we now know what to do. It's just a matter of the moats. We've got a climb underneath the caravan to set up some more cabling. And this time of the year. However, I should say before I go into that last one, I should say that the caravan at the moment is sitting on my drive. Station management. Not. You have got no chance, sunshine. You're about two years behind the <laughs> trailer. Two years behind the <laughs> The words yellow and trailer are about to appear. <laughs> but against that, I would say that the caravan is 12 foot by 8, 13 foot by 8 foot, and the yellow trailer is a diminutive little postage stamp. However, <laughs> so there we go. The, the credit, so to speak, he credit, I think, goes to him. We wouldn't have got it if he'd not been in the right place at the right time and thought of us when that caravan was becoming available. He could have flogged it, got a couple hundred quid for it. He didn't. He gave it to us. So, pat on the back there to, uh, to Ian. Thank you very much for that. And to be honest, that isn't the end of it, because as I say, the mugs have done all the plugging and playing. But when you look at the number of people in the team that have provided facilities for this thing to actually come together, the number of people are high. And to be perfectly honest, I sat there last week when I was doing this, racking my brain. I know there are other people who did various bits and pieces and provided other bits and pieces, but damn if I could A, a remember who they were, or B, fit them on the screen, because there were too many. So all I would say on behalf of everybody is thanks very much, team for providing all the various bits and pieces and the ideas and the thinking about where we could go with this. It's been quite interesting activity, hasn't it? It has been quite interesting. interesting. <laughs> but uh, I think in the, at the end, it's a worthwhile thing to have gone for. Would we do it again? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll probably do it better, because we aren't. Yeah, we've had experience. Yeah, we've been there. We've done it now. We've worn the T-shirt. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Swindon and District Amateur Radio Mobile Operations Room.